Section 17 of Neighbourhood, A Year's Life in and About an English Village by Tickner Edwards, August, Part 2. 3. In winter time, when nights are dark and ways be foul, I can conceive of no pleasanter aspect of village life at any season than the indoor fireside one. But when the long, radiant August evenings are here, there is equally no other time for me. More and more with every year that glides by, life in Windlecombe at this season seems to focus itself round the seven sisters' trees upon the green. All the summer day through the old folk gather there, and always a low murmur of voices comes drifting up to my window from their garrulous company. But it is after the day's work is done, and all, able or disabled, are free for recreation, that the true life of the place begins. There is something about the ease-taking of men physically tired after a long day's work in fresh air and sunshine that fascinates one who is only mind-weary, and that alone from much chaffering with pen and ink though you have but cramped limbs to stretch out over the greensward and by comparison but a torpid attenuated flow in your veins somewhat of your neighbour's healthful dog-tired humour overbrims upon you and after a pipe or two and an hour's slow desultory chat you can almost forget the tang of the study the reek of old leather burdening imprisoned air and congratulate yourself on a man's work manfully done, albeit vicariously. The day-long tussle with the good earth, mammoth, nunches, and eleveners devoured under hedgerows, a shirt a score of times soused with honest sweat, and as many dried by the thirsty harvest sun. All the old Windlecombe faces were there to-night under the drooping pine boughs and most of the middle-aged ones the younger men and boys were down on the mead at cricket practice and there they would stay as long as a glimmer of daylight remained in the sky but the sun had still a fathom to go before it would lie red and lusty caught in the toils of the far-off stavisham hills i evaded with what grace i could the cake of ship's tobacco held out to me by captain stallwood accepting as fair compromise a charge from the tin box of old tom clemmer his dearest friend gradually the talk got back to the point where my coming had intersected it tis true said the captain now true as i sets here on a plank o the old king as you cut and shaped yourself dan'l i followed his glance round the circle of benches there was not a head among the company but was wagging dubiously old daniel dray's face was an incredulous a horrified blank what said he a human critter swallow seventeen live i seed it interrupted the captain pointing his pipe stem solemnly at us for emphasis i seed it with my own pair of eyes little lirrupy green chaps they was all hopping and somersetting in the basket and the blackamoor a puts his mouth to the lip of it and hup hup says he and every time he says it one of em jumps in and when they was all down a gives a sort of gruggle and scoos his head o'er the basket and hup hup says he again and every time he says it out pops but there tis no sense telling you folks sees none of the world in little small village places and ain't got no beliefs he was silent for a while then brought out a tobacco box like a brass halfpenny bun and held it up to the common view it was old and battered and had certain initials scratched on the lid the captain fingered it in mournful reminiscence looky now he said i don't rightly know as i ever told you g b that bean't tom stallard bean't ah no says all on you ready you now twere george's old george budgeon as daniel what year war as i went off to sea daniel dray's lips moved in silent calculation 
73 belike or maybe 74 cos you'd been gone joe a year afore harker's coo slipped the five-legged heifer and that were ah true dan'l and george budgeon a were shipmate along o me pretty soon arter i gooed away well and this here backy box it's the least time as i see that here george's hand i took a fill out of it just afore he went on watch and it come on to blow that night gorm out it blow and rain not half and in the morning never a sign of poor george budgeon to be seen well now full a fortnight after that what'd we do but catch a girt thresher on a trail line and inside o the critter what'd we find but a halibur big as a tay tray all alive and lippin o were says the cap'n i were ship's boy then joe says he get and plain un and i'll hang for me supper he says now then dan'l you'll never believe it but true as you sets there clink goes my knife again summer inside of the halibut and go on stallard <laughs> we all knows what be a comin cap'n and there were ah but you'll ne'er believe it not if you was jonah yourself there inside of the halibut were a girt rusty hook as what say dan'l don't he say it again dan'l you a regular prayers goer too the captain filled his pipe from the box tragically ruminating in the silence that followed ah poor george budgeon a little knowed as twould be the last time as i'd pass his tobacco box to a friend the sun had long set and the dusk was creeping up apace here and there in the shadowy length of the street lights were beginning to break out where we sat under the dense canopy of pine boughs night had already asserted itself and to one another we were little more than an arc of glowing pipe bowls old stallwood chuckled richly from his corner a sort of inspiration of mendacity seemed to have come over him to-night but lord bless you he went on that bean't nothing not when you've been five and thirty year at sea i knowed a man onct as worked in a steam sawmill way over in ameriky somewheres and what did a do one fine morning but get his self sawed in two pieces and one piece died the doctor could do naught to save it but t'other piece kept alive for ten year arterwards ah and did a man's work every day old daniel bounced to his feet he breathed hard for a full half minute joe stallard he said at last severely shame on you for a regular hout and hout old liar a man cut in two and lived ten year arter leastways the one part of him for shame joe tis traipsin about in all the even countries i reckons as has spiled you ah well well a day there they be lighten up at the thatchers come along tom clemmer three squares of red shone out amidst the twinkling dust of the street denoting the curtained windows of the inn it was the signal for which all had been waiting and a general stir took place in the assembly at length none remained about me but the old seaman he had said nothing while the dismemberment of the group was in progress but had sat shaking in silent merriment now he too got slowly to his feet tis wonderful he observed moving away real unaccountable the little simple things as some folks won't believe there be a thing now as but this story of partitioned yet still living humanity even though it came from america was too much also for me and i told him so he stopped in his easy saunter towards the inn tis true he averred as stoutly as ever his rich oily chuckle came over to me through the darkness mind you i didn't say as the man were sawed in a two equal parts to about the thumb of him as were taken off belike i'll just step across to the thatchers now and tell that to dan'l end of section seventeen section eighteen of Neighbourhood, A Year's Life in and About an English Village by Tickner Edwards. 
September Part One. One. August holiday makers in Windlecombe are mainly of the normal, obvious kind, the people for whom guidebooks and picture postcards are produced, and by whom the job masters and the boat proprietors gain a livelihood. But September brings to the village a wandering crew of an altogether different complexion. There is something about the temperate sunshine and general slowing up and sweetening of life during this month that draws from their hiding nooks in the city suburbs a class of man and woman for whom i have long entertained the profoundest respect with every year as soon as september comes round i find myself looking out for these stray for the most part solitary folk and in quite a humble unpretentious spirit taking them beneath my avuncular wing that they seek the quiet of an inland village in september and not the feverish belated distractions of the seaside town is an initial point in their favour but almost invariably they bring with them a much more subtle recommendation they are down for a holiday but they have come entirely without premeditation suddenly yielding to a sort of migratory impulse they have locked up dusty chambers or left small shops to the care of wives or begged a few precious days from niggardly employers and come away on a spate of emotional longing for country quiet and greenery irresistible this time though generally the impulse has been felt and resisted every autumn for twenty years back indeed there must be some specially fatal quality about this period of time for i constantly hear the same story no holiday taken for twenty years at noon to-day after a long tramp through the fields i came up the village street and paused irresolutely outside the three thatchers inn the morning had been hot and the walk tiring moreover it was the first of september and the guns had been popping distressfully in all the coverts by the way i knew that before sundown a brace or two of partridges would be certain to find their road to my door but this did not prove and never has proved compensation for the flurry and disturbance carried by the noise of the guns into all my favourite conning places or arenas for quiet thought the whole world of wild life was in a panic and i with it the red ochred doorstep of the inn glowed in the sunshine at my feet and from the cool darkness beyond came a chink of glasses and murmur of many tongues it all seemed eminently consolatory for the moment's mood within there no one would fire a gun off at my ear nor stalk past me with a shoulder load of limp sanguinary spoil nor warn me out of my favourite coppices with a finger to the lip as though a nation of babies slumbered within i was a lost man even before i began to hesitate i stood my stout furze walking-stick in the porch beside a drover's staff a shepherd's crook and three or four undenominational cudgels and plunged down the two steps into the bar now before my eyes had accustomed themselves to the subdued light and i could see what company was about me i had become aware of a strange odour in the air it was the scent of a tobacco happily unknown in windlecombe neither wholly latakia nor turkish nor honeydew alone nor red virginia cavendish nor returns but a curious internecine blend of all these i knew it at once to be something for which i have a constitutional loathing one of the new town mixtures wherein are confused and mutually stultified all the good smoking weeds in the world looking more narrowly about me after the usual greetings i discovered a vast and elaborate meerschaum pipe in the corner and behind it a little diffident smiling man 
but this could not entirely account for the overpowering exotic reek in the room i missed the familiar smell of our own good windlecombe shag although there were half a dozen other pipes in full blast round me and then i realized the situation the stranger had seduced all the company to his pestilent combination and now as i lowered at him through the haze he was holding out his pouch even to me who would not have touched his garbage if it had been the last pipe fill left on earth but he took my curt almost surly refusal as if it were an intended kindness ah you do not smoke well it does seem a kind of insult to the pure country air but in towns you know what with the din and the dust and the strain on one's nerves everybody and of course i must not quarrel with my bread and butter i produced my own pipe and pouch and filled brutally under his very nose serenely he watched the operation and without a trace of offence i'm in the trade as i was telling these gentlemen here when you came in do you know the walworth road in london my shop is just behind the elephant and any day you're passing i but wasn't i glad to get away if only for the few hours and i do assure you sir i haven't been out of london for nearly nearly twenty years i suppose he looked at me in placid surprise law how did you know that now but it is quite true being single-handed you see it isn't easy to but i was glad i tell you and i had never seen a real country village in my life until i got out of the train at stavisham and walked on here isn't it quiet and how funny it seems no asphalt paving and no wires running all ways over the housetops and the singing birds all loose in the trees and flowers i suppose there is a law to prevent people picking em there were no end along by the road i came somehow my heart warmed to this inconsiderable by-product of civilization that had strayed amongst us and presently as much to my own surprise as his i found myself loitering down the hill again with him at my elbow having promised to show him that there were other flowers in the country beside the dust-throttled daisies and dandelions of the roadside we took the path that runs between the river and the wood he soon let his pipe go out for he moved in open-mouthed wonder all the way which rendered smoking impracticable at last we came to a bend in the river where the bank sloped gently down to the waterside covered with all the rich hued september growths and we sat down to rest i did not plague him with the names of things nor with any talk at all but lay for the most part silently watching the effect of the place upon him as one might study the demeanour of a dormouse let loose amidst the like surroundings straight from ratcliffe highway he took off coat and hat and sat quite still for a while with legs drawn up and his chin upon his knees but presently he fell to wandering about like a child ducking his pallid bald head over each flower as he came to it but keeping his itching fingers resolutely clasped behind his back it was a brave show even for this brave time of year though other months afford perhaps a greater variety in colour and kind nature in early autumn seems more forceful and impressive because she concentrates her energies into the dealing of the one blow the urging of the one appeal upon the colour sense it was the purple month look where we would the same royal colour filled the sunshine purple loosestrife edged the river and purple knapweed thistles heather purple thyme and willow herb and climbing vetch hemmed us in on every side paler of hue yet still of the same regal dye the wild mint and cranesbill marjoram and calamint crowded upon one another and close to the water's edge the michaelmas daisies were already in full flower 
under both banks the soil was tinged with their pure cool lilac mirrored again yet more faintly in the drowsy water below for half an hour perhaps the little tobacconist wandered up and down this enchanted place and then he came back to me treading on tiptoe hushed and solemn-eyed as if he were in church you live hereabouts he asked in a voice little above a whisper all the year round don't you and nothing to do but just put on a hat whenever you want to come here and in ten minutes here you are nothing to pay and no trouble oh my stars and it is not always the same you know i pass this way nearly every week and there is always something different the flowers change with every month you hear different birds singing according to the season the leaves on the trees come and go and the sky shows you a new picture every time you look at it even the river changes it is the top of the tide now that log floating out there has not moved a dozen feet in the last five minutes but in an hour's time the water will be driving down swift and strong and all the reeds and rushes that now stand up quite straight and still in the sunshine will be bending and trembling in the flow ah oh, he crowded a perfectly bewildering variety of emotions into the breathed monosyllable is that a nightingale singing over there no you are too late for nightingales they have done singing these two months and more that is a robin the robins have just begun to sing again after their summer silence and when that happens you know the summer is almost done he sat now mute at my side for so long that at last i must steal a glance at him i saw him brush a hand hastily across his eyes i i am glad i came of course said he musing but i have been the worst kind of fool all the same just think of going back there to-night lord just think of it yesterday morning i watered the geraniums in the window-boxes and gave the canary his seed and says i here's singing birds and flowers as good as any you'll get in the country then i went to the shop door and saw a cart full of straw going by and another of green cabbages for borough market law i says the country comes on wheels to your very door in london london for me and now i'll never get that feeling back again no never the very worst kind of fool i don't think close by us there grew a great tuft of valerian as he sat staring tragically at its disk of deep red blossom butterflies came to it with every moment sipping a while then passed on painted ladies red admirals little tortoise shells always in twos or threes finally a peacock butterfly sailed over to the valerian and settled there her rich colours aflare in the sunshine she spread out her great veins the upper covering the lower then she gently slid her upper wings forward and gradually the wonderful spots on the lower wings appeared like a pair of slowly opening drowsy violet eyes the little tobacconist breathed hard i can see it all clear enough he said tremulously a man gets a real chance here come worry come sickness come bad luck come anything you like all you've got to do is to open your eyes and ears and off it goes like the bundle of sins in the pilgrim's progress book but in london he stopped short then in a tone of deep despairing disgust geraniums canaries cartloads of cabbages bah i had not found myself confronted by so difficult a proposition for many a long day if only the reverend had been there but there was nothing for it but to try a joust with the situation alone depend upon it said i if coming amongst the beautiful natural things of the world has made you despise the mean ugly necessary parts of your life then you have been a fool indeed one of the worst kind but are you really the sort of fool you think and have you not overstated both cases alike in neither town nor country 
is there all of good or all of evil there are plenty of geraniums and cabbages in windlecombe and alas canaries and in london there is plenty of beauty if you look for it with the right eyes beauty in london he repeated incredulously yes truly and the people who see it and enjoy it most are just those people who have the deepest knowledge of and love for the natural things of the countryside now shall i tell you what sort of a fool you really are he thought a moment eyeing me in some perplexity well yes said he at last if it isn't too much trouble it is a lot of trouble and i am not sure i can do it but i will try did you ever hear of the saying where ignorance is bliss tis folly to be wise no i can't say that i ever well you have fallen right into that trap you have given yourself twenty years of that kind of bliss and now you have got to pay for it but what was it made you start off this morning in such a hurry to get to the country when only yesterday you were quite content with your window boxes and your screeching yellow gewgaw he considered a little then blushed to his eyes it was an old book he said mysteriously looking round apparently to make certain we were alone nothing but an old book on a bookstall i picked it up just out of curiosity as i went by last night and there were some dried flowers in it dog roses i think and then i looked up and saw the moon shining very small and bright high up in the sky and it came over me that though she kept one eye dutifully on the walworth road with the other eye she might well be looking down on the country lane where those roses grew years ago and thinks i all of a creep like why can't a man look two ways at once and if he must give one eye to business why can't he give the other to just what he likes and then i and then you certainly left off being the kind of fool i mean left off for ever well that saves us both a lot of trouble for we are both wrong about your case it seems you need not fear to go home to-night you will find those geraniums as fresh and sweet as the valerian there and just as populous of butterflies and the canary you will hear in his song every morning the notes of all the wild birds that have sung to you to-day and when next a wagon-load of straw goes by your shop it will not be mere straw but a field of wheat under the country sunshine the sound of the wind in the walworth telephone wires will be for you only the rustle of wind in the corn that is what i meant by london beauty end of section eighteen please subscribe to update new videos please share and like if you enjoyed the video thanks so much